Good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the EduSight Network. Today we are going to focus on the external methods of control over administration. Yesterday we talked about the internal methods of control and as I just introduced we will talk about the external methods and for the discussion we have thus in the studio Dr. M.P. Jain. He has been a former reader. He is a retired faculty from the University of Delhi Zakir Hussain College and he has an experience of over 35 years of teaching in political science and public administration. Some of the books he has published I would like to mention the titles are Political Theory, Liberal and Marxian. The second book would be Comparative Political Theory and the recent published book would be Political Theory, Concept and Debates. It is a pleasure to have you here sir and uh, we request you to uh, talk about the external methods of control over administration. Thank you Urvashi. Friends, this afternoon we are going to discuss the second aspect of control over administration. Yesterday we discussed internal control. Internal controls are just like inbuilt mechanisms in the administration itself. Just like a brake in the car, internal controls are there. But external controls are like red light, like traffic police inspector which may compel you to stop the car. Internal controls are not sufficient because those are departmental matters. In a democracy, we require solid and effective external controls over the administration. Some of the external controls, well known one, are legislative control, executive control, judicial control, control by the public and above all very recently in the whole world the concept of Lokpal controlling the public administration as well as government corruption has emerged. So these are some of the controls which we, we shall discuss briefly. First of all legislative control. Legislative control means control by the parliament. In India the constitution is supreme and parliament has to work under the constitution. Unlike Britain, Indian parliament is not a sovereign body. In India parliament means Sansad which has two houses, one Lok Sabha elected by the people directly and more important house than second house which is Rajya Sabha. In Lok Sabha there are 545 members, 43 elected and 2 nominated. In Rajya Sabha there are about 250 members representative of the different states. Both in Britain as well as in America the battle cry of the revolutions there was controlled by the parliament. In 1649 there was Puritan revolution in England and the demand of this revolution was no expenditure without the approval of parliament. They respected the king. He refused to accept the mandate of the house and was killed in the Puritan revolution. He was brutally murdered. In America again we found the same demand. The battle cry of the American revolution was no taxation without representation. Representation here means of course the elected representative of the people. So legislative control over the executive actions and administration has been a fundamental demand during the past three to four centuries with the advent of modernism this demand gained importance both in Britain and America. And this very demand is the demand for democracy. That is the control of the people's representative or the arbitrariness of administration as well as the executive. 
What are the methods of legislative control? These methods are different in parliamentary democracies and presidential democracies. India, Britain, and many countries of the world, they are parliamentary democracies. In parliamentary democracies, there is no separation of power between the executive on the one hand and legislature on the other hand. Whereas in the presidential form of government, there is separation of power between the executive and the legislature. And that's why the system of parliamentary control in practice in both these systems are slightly different. Here we shall discuss mainly the legislative control in parliamentary democracies. Following are the ways in which this control can be exercised. There are many ways that legislature can exercise the control. First is presidential speech. Second is budget discussion. We will discuss these in slight details. Third is question hour in the parliament. Fourth is zero hour in the parliament. Fifth is adjournment debates. Sixth is no confidence motion. Seventh is debates on the legislation. Eighth is parliamentary committees. Ninth is audit. And last is control over the delegated legislation. Now all these will be di discussed briefly. Today we are a bit constrained of time because the topic is lengthy and we have to compress it within one hour. Presidential speech is delivered by the head of the state in the beginning of the new session in February in India. Before the budget session, this speech is delivered. Both the houses of parliament assemble in the central hall and president addresses the MPs both of Rajya Sabha as well as Lok Sabha sitting together. Here president gives the outline of the broad policies which will come up in the year. By broad policies I mean to say the main ideology translated into practice by the government in charge. Then after the presidential debate is over, there is a debate on it. In India, four days are given for the general discussion on the presidential debate. And during these four days, members of the parliament they discuss policies one by one in a broad manner, not very minutely but broadly. And they criticize it, they attack the government, they attack the administration for various acts of omission and commission during this presidential address debates. Now presidential address is a very ceremonial kind of occasion. Though president is a nominal head, only once in a year he addresses the parliament and his address is not written by him but by the prime minister and his cabinet. He can't add any word or can't delete any word out of it. So presidential speech in a way is a speech delivered by the prime minister through president's mouth. The second kind of control is a very important kind of control, that is budget discussion. Budget is a document which lays down the sources of income and the ways in, in which it will be expended by the government. Income and expenditure of the government for the whole year. This budget is presented by the executive in the parliament. Immediately after presidential address and debate on that, budget is presented on a set date. Earlier this year's date used to be 28th February, both in India and in England. But now things have changed because there are governments which are not able to complete their own 
problem. After the presentation of the budget, general discussion on the budget takes place. At this stage, discussion relates to the budget as a whole or any question of principle involved therein. therein. There should not be any detailed discussion, discussion item wise, simply a general discussion. The general line of budget is discussed, attacked and placed by the general MPs. All the MPs participate in this debate and this debate is very crucial since most of the MPs or different political parties want to criticize the budgetary policy of the government. After general discussion on the budget, then comes the ne next and most important stage of the budget that is detailed discussion on the voting of grants. Grants in aid. Government seeks money through grants. There are two kinds of funds in India. One is Consolidated Fund of India, second is Contingency Fund of India. The expenditure charged to the Consolidated Fund of India are beyond the debate in Parliament. They are charged expenditure. Parliament can't debate them. During this stage, the discussion is confined to items. Each and every grant, each and every item explained by the government, each and every money demanded by the government is debated. And each head of the demand thus comes under the purview of the members of parliament. This is necessary because the control of the public purse is the most powerful guarantee of ministerial responsibility. During this stage, the third stage comes when report of the CAG, CAG, Public Accounts Committee and Estimates Committee, etc. are discussed during the budget itself. Third method is question hour. The very first hour in parliament sessions, beginning of the day, that is at 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock, is known as question hour. Any member can, can ask any question with regard to the administration. It is a very, very powerful tool in the hands of the opposition to harass government or to take government to task. Because question may pertain to any department. Government is bound to reply all the questions and through questions, attention of the public is also diverted towards the lapses of administration. Policies and activities of the government come under scrutiny of each and every MP. And simply through questions, MPs hammer the government for their, on their alleged weak points. After the question hour is over at, that is at 12 o'clock, there comes further one hour, one hour and that is known as zero hour. It is a fourth way in which parliament is able to control the administration. Zero hour is invoked immediately after the question hour. During the zero hour, the members of parliament can raise matters of public importance, even if not listed in day's agenda. Every session of parliament has an agenda. Every day they come out with an agenda and you can't go out of the agenda in that very day, except by the adjournment motion and all that, that we will discuss. But in zero hour, if presiding officer permits, members can raise any issue of public importance and that will be discussed by the parliament. So zero hour is important in the sense that it is free for all. Here any issue of public importance only can be taken, but here permission of the chair is to be taken, whereas in question hour that is not the case. The fifth way by which Parliament can exercise control is adjournment motion. 
it is a very very important tool in the hands of the mps members of parliament to bring out important discussions and out of the way discussions in the house in adjournment motion the normal functioning of the house house is adjourned and the issue that is the important matter which opposition wants to discuss should be taken up during this time every other business of the house stands suspended agenda of, of the house stands suspended and if adjournment motion is passed then discussion on the important matter takes place the most important thing in the adjournment motion is that there is voting after the motion with regard to other things voting is not there but if in the adjournment motion during the voting governments government get defeated immediately the government has to resign because that is a vote against the government so adjournment motion is a very very powerful tool in the hands of the opposition and general mps thereby they can take important matters now what is important matter this has to be decided by the speaker every matter cannot be important matter only very important matter of national importance has to be taken up in the adjournment motion then next comes the most important motion in the house which has been successfully used in the indian context to remove two prime ministers one was moraji desai who was defeated in the confident motion and second was vp singh who again was defeated in the adjournment motion and they had to go no confidence motion as the name suggest is to express con no confidence in the government if unsatisfied by the government functioning then members can bring no confidence motion against the government this is also known as censor motion which means that members of the parliament are censoring the government a motion is moved by a member to express lack of confidence in the government for any reason the motion if allowed is debated upon as a conclusion of the such debate a vote of confidence is sought by the government after the debate on the no confidence motion is over government seeks a vote of confidence and if failed then government has to go so no confidence motion is the most important motion in the sense that it shows the government the way out as i have said earlier two governments in india have been removed by no confidence motion that of moraji desai in 70s late 70s and that of vp singh in late 80s next is debates on legislation in theory as well as in practice no law shall become operative unless it is passed by both the houses, houses of parliament in case of deadlock between both the houses there are procedures of resolving it every law made is presented to parliament it is discussed by the members amendments are proposed and it can be rejected as well as passed by the house in case it is rejected government comes under fire because it shows that government doesn't have majority normally the government bills are passed private member bills may be passed may not be passed there are two kind of bills proposed in the parliament one is government bill which government proposes and most of the bills are government bills 
and another are private member bills. Any member can pro propose anything which he may suggest that should be enacted and converted into law. Now here various readings of the bill take place, first reading, second reading, third reading and so on. And par parliament criticizes each aspect of the bill. Law will not be passed so easily. If the law is anti-public, then there is widespread criticism. Say for example, FDI investment in India, a very controversial issue it has been during the regime of present government. So every bill has to be presented, read once, twice, thrice, discussed, debated, amended by the parliament. If amendments are proposed, it is up to the government to accept them or not. If there is too much criticism of the bill, then government may withdraw it as they withdrew FDI bill and many other bills. Because if there is too much criticism and the bill is put to vote and it is defeated, then government will be in trouble. So parliament has the final authority of making law and discussions are there to see that the laws are perfect. And once the laws are passed, then opposition loses the right to criticize the bill which has become an act. After passing by the parliament, the bill becomes an act. Now again, next way of control is through parliamentary committees. Parliament has certain very powerful committees which are composed of representatives of the government on the one hand and opposition parties on the other hand. In these committees, members of the opposition parties are included in good number, though the majority of the members are from the ruling party. The most important committees in Indian context are estimates committee which evaluates the different estimates or demands of grant proposed by the government, public accounts committee, public accounts committee comes into action only when money is spent, they want to see whether the money has been spent for on the job for which it was allocated, whether it was they spent in a nice way, whether there was any corruption here or not, and all the kind of things. With regard to Commonwealth Games, it was Public Accounts Committee and CAG, Control and Auditor General of India, which raised the objections. And public came to know about the irregularities in spending the money. Because money spending is very important issue in any polity. So estimates committee and public accounts committee, they are basically concerned as to how the money is demanded by the government, whether that is in right proportion or not, and how the money is spent, whether it has been spent judiciously or in the arbitrary manner on the items which are not projected in the budget. Third is committee on public undertakings. India is a mixed economy. There are many important public undertakings. There are Navratans like NTPC, like Bail, because they earn money for the government. And there is a committee to look into the working of public corporations or public undertakings. Because public undertakings are business enterprises of the government. Irregularities are possible there at a vast scale. So committee on public undertakings composed of both opposition as well as ruling party takes care of the functioning of the public undertakings. And the last is there is a committee on assurances. 
politicians make lot of assurances to the people before election and after election. But there is no authority to check whether those assurances have been fulfilled or not. On the contrary, whenever government gives any assurance in the parliament, that assurance must be fulfilled. There is a committee to see the development of the government election on the assurances. These assurances cannot be like the assurances given by the politicians to the general public. These are the governmental assurances which they gave at the floor of the house to the members of parliament and the people of India. So four committees are there which control administration, which control expenditure of the departments, which take care of the grants, whether those are good or bad, and which takes care of the public corporations and above all of the governmental assurances in the parliament. So these committees, committee system is there in Britain also. We have adopted it from Britain and in Britain the committees are very powerful because these are not governmental committees only since opposition members are also there, opposition MPs only are there in this committee. Next is audit. In India, there is CAG, Controller and Auditor General of India. He is responsible for maintaining the accounts, for auditing the accounts and reporting the irregularities found in the account to the parliament. CAG is an independent body. No pressure will work on that. Among the four pillars of democracy in India, one is Supreme Court, second is Election Commission, Third is CAG and fourth is supposed to be Lokpal which has yet to be created in the Indian context in the right manner. All important scams are uncovered by CAG, whether it is coal scam or it is telecom scam, whether it is commonwealth scam, all the scams are reported by the CAG in its report and this report is submitted to parliament and parliament discusses this report in minute details and public comes to know about the irregularities committed by the government with regard to finances because finances as I said earlier are the most important matter and public is interested that these hard earn money of the public and hard earn money of the government should not go waste. Next is delegated legislation. Delegated legislation means that parliament cannot pass each and every law. They delegate the power to make law to, to the executive and different departments and these departments make the law and get the approval of the parliament. So delegated legislation is a very undemocratic kind of method for making laws. But it is inevitable because parliament with it, its limited hours of work cannot pass each and every law. They pass certain, pass certain skeleton laws, details are to be filled by the delegated legislative power of the government. So delegated legislation must be controlled by the parliament. Executive and administration cannot be given 100% authority to make any law at their discretion, no. So any law made by the administration and executive is under the scrutiny of the parliament. Now these are some of the methods by which parliament can control both executive, which is a part of the administration, and administration which is a part of the executive power of the state. Now we shall see what are the difficulties in legislative control. Discussion shows that legislative control is a very effective kind of method 
to control the government. But in reality, it does not work. In reality, it is virtually effectless. It is not effective. The reason is very simple. Government has majority in the lower house. And government is only responsible to the lower house. With its powerful majority, if it is a one-party government, they are able to sail through. Opposition cannot do anything because of their numerical strength in the parliament. So there are many limitations which we shall discuss. First of all, the numerical strength of the parliament is very big for exercising control. Debates, debates and debates shall go on and no outcome will come. Secondly, it has lack of time. The parliament which is going out, look, I mean to say Lok Sabha, it has functioned for very less hours during the whole five years. There were disturbances after disturbances. For long period the layoff was there. For 20 days continuously the parliament was not allowed to function on the Lokpal bill issue and many other issues, FDI issues. So parliament has very less time to exert, exert effective control and in most of the meaningful areas. Secondly, there are no sustained measures of control and surveillance. Members of parliament cannot constantly have the control. They will have debate in the parliament, they will go home, they will forget, next morning, morning they will get up and they will forget what happened yesterday. Thirdly, in India and many developer, developing countries, third world countries, there is a wide gulf between administration and people. And members are not able to project their aspirations in the legislature. Fourthly, educational standard or professional standards of the member of parliament. Governing requires technical knowledge. Most of the members are not that qualified that they can put effective control on the administration. Fifthly, there are vested interests in parliament. These vested interests simply want to get the th things done in their way and parliament in this way becomes a body to further the interest of the pressure groups. Next, during authoritative regimes, the parliament can become captive of the majority party. If there is thumping majority of a party, they will not listen to the opposition. An opposition cannot have its say in the right manner. Then government, since is of majority, normally it does not allow opposition to function in the desired manner. Eighthly, there is no training of the MPs to control the administration and to suggest the ways by which they can control the administration. When they criticize the demand for grants, 
they do not know what for the ministry is, what for the money will be spent, how much money will be spent last year, of course they know, but future projections they are unable to understand. So normally, the technical qualifications come in the way. Again, last limitation is parliament cannot raise money or cannot suggest taxes. Only execution, executive will demand and the demand can be either reduced or increased. But parliament cannot say that there should be money for this kind of thing because government has to take care of the finances and if government puts a demand, then parliament can either reduce it or can increase it. Now the second kind of control is executive control. Executive means ministers and cabinet. Executive is there for a limited period whereas civil service or administration is a permanent job holder. The main controversy in the Indian context has been whether executive can control the administration and up to what level it can control the administration. If a minister wants to get a wrong thing done by the administration, is administration under obligation to do it or can they object? Again, executive only is responsible to parliament, civil service is not responsible. Executive is a political body. It is composed of politicians. All the ministry, ministers are politicians or elected MPs of the either Rajya Sabha or Lok Sabha. Executives formulate policy and administration is supposed to implement the policy and civil service is supposed to work under the direction of the executive. Now, since executive is responsible and civil service is not, logic demands that executive must have full control over the civil services. Otherwise, responsibility there will be on them and work will be done by the civil servants and they will be responsible for the work of those over whom they do not have any control. Now, what are the ways in which executive can control the public administration? During internal control, we saw many methods by which executive can control. Basically, executive control is internal control because it is in-house matter, in-ministry matter, and there is no outside force involved in the control. Executive can control the public administration by appointment and dismissal. Power of appointment and dismissal is there with the executive. And that is the force of the minister. He becomes a formidable man or woman because civil servants know that they can be dismissed they can be transferred, they can be put to lower ranks by the minister. So first is appointment and dismissal. Second is policy is made and formulated by the ministry, that is executive, and executive has got the power to pass ordinances. Through these, they can control the public administration. Administrators have to follow the policy. They cannot have deviation. They can't deviate from the policy. So executed by the executives, formulated by the executives. If policy is wrong, even then they are supposed to implement it because responsibility doesn't die, lie with them. So policy implementation is the only task of administrators, whereas policy formulation is 
the task of executives. Thirdly, code of conduct, a very important method of controlling administrators in the hands of executive. Yesterday in the internal control, I discussed about it in the administrative ethics. So code of conduct, conduct is formulated by the executive and administrators, civil service servants have to follow that code of conduct. Now, fourth and the last ways by which executive can control the administrators is appeal to public. Since they are politicians, everybody knows them, or most of the people know them. They are having a public worth and public image. They may be popular or unpopular, but they are having some hold on public. After all, it is the public who has elected them. So whenever administrator, administration is not listening to them or is not willing to cooperate, they can always go to public. Though there is, there is a secrecy code, in spite of that, ministers have got a vast public appeal which bureaucrats do not have. Public do not know bureaucrats. Who is the secretary of the government of India is not the concern of public. Because public has neither elected them nor they are responsible to public. But ministers, that is executive, have a vast public image. Third kind of control is judicial control. Very important control it is. Judiciary is the guardian of the constitution. For anything unconstitutional, one can appeal to judiciary and judiciary can declare that null and void. This power of the judiciary is known as the power of judicial review over law, policy, ordinances and other matters. Judiciary decides about the legality, whereas legislature decides about policy and expenditure, policy and finances. If there is anything illegal or unconstitutional, then judiciary will take note of it if somebody appeals to judiciary, files a suit against the judiciary. It is the champion of human rights and protect the human rights from violation. The sphere of judicial control is limited. First of all, under its sphere comes misuse of power. If anybody, whether it is a civil servant or a minister who is misusing his power, then anybody can appeal, file a suit against them in the court of law. And judiciary will decide on that. Second is lack of authority. If somebody is acting without authority, he does not have the authority to do, do that. Say for example, a tra traffic police inspector simply taking away your vehicle, which the authority of which he does not have, or a police constable simply knocking at your door at 12 in the night without warrant, hmm? then this is lack of authority. If any government agency exceeds the authority or does not have the authority, then one can appeal against the court, in the court against that very authority. Third is lack of legality. If any illegal thing is done by any civil servant or by executive or by any political party, whatsoever, whosoever it may be, then writ or suit can be filed, filed against that illegal kind of activity or law or policy or ordinance. Fourthly, misrepresentation of facts. If government is misrepresenting the facts, misrepresentation of fact means government is trying to give wrong kind of facts with regard to anything. 
then people can file a suit against that kind of misrepresentation against the government. And lastly, procedural defects. If there are wrong procedures adopted by any governmental agency or administration, people can go to court against those wrong kind of procedures. What are the means of control of in the hands of judiciary? Time is less. We will discuss these briefly. First of all, it can declare any law illegal, unconstitutional, and it can nullify that law. Whether it is passed by parliament, whether it is passed by executive in the form of ordinances, or any other governmental agency, or any other, any bureaucrat. Secondly, it can hear cases against ministers and not against president. President is above Supreme Court judicial review. So if any minister has commit, committed any fraud or is a correct one, people can knock the door of the court. They can go to court and court will take care of that. Many scams which came to light, people have filed the suit. In Supreme Court, lot of cases are pending in which government is the culprit or is the accused. Apart from this, there are five fundamental writs which any individual can directly file in the Supreme Court. Right. Sir, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but can we take a question? Yes, we can take. Uh, pl uh, please uh, ask your question. Hello? Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Geeta. Yes, Geeta. Uh, how are you doing and what do you do, Geeta? Uh, I want to ask a question. I have PhD in post-graduation, so I want to give an exam for the UGC NET. So I want to ask how to do this and how to do preparation and how to buy a book. In which subject are you preparing for the UGC NET? I want to prepare public administration. Sir, uh, public administration se, uh, UGC net dena hai. So huh. she wants to know which books she can refer to. Which books? See, there are a number of books in the market. As per the syllabus of the net, there are many books. And almost all the books of public administration, say, one by S.R. Maheshwari, late S.R. Maheshwari, the book is there, quite popular. Then there is another book by Tyagi, which you can refer. Then in the market, many other books, health books, we can say, or test books, are available as the subject. So books on administration are not in short supply. And most important thing with regard to public administration preparation to, for any exam is that there is one IIPA, Indian Institute of Public Administration. That is located very near to CG, CAG office or an income tax office, very near to Rajghat, near ITU it is. And everybody can use that library after paying a small amount of money. So that, that is the best place for public administration concerned materials. And there are lot of books on administration there which you can very easily refer. I think that is... Yeah, sir, that okay. should be satisfactory, sir. And sir, we can continue with our lecture. So let's resume the talk. Now there are writs. As I said, writs can be filed in Supreme Court directly without any court fees because these are concerned with the fundamental rights of man. Most important writ is that of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus means that if any of your friend or family member is lost, is not available, in spite of all the complaints to the police, you can file a writ in the Supreme Court 
of habeas corpus. This means that shows the body of the man. So and so, Mr. X is not available, is not traceable. In spite of police complaints, he or she is not traceable. And Supreme Court should show us the body of the man. This is habeas corpus. Let us have the body of the right. man. Sir, we are getting another caller. Hmm. Another question? Yes? Yes? Hello? Can, yes? Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. What is the question? Ma'am, I'm not going to ask you. Yes, I'm going to ask you. Please ask your question. Ma'am, tell me, we are a student. Yes. Hello? Yes, I'm listening. Ma'am, tell me, we are a student. Yes. Sir, I'm listening. आप अपने टेलीविजन की आवाज धीमी कर लीजिए। तो आप बता सकते हैं। आप प्लीज अपने टेलीविजन की आवाज धीमी करिए। हम आपको सुन पाएंगे ठीक तरह से। हम हम ये पूछना चाहते हैं। हेलो। जी जी बोलिए। हम ये में के स्टूडेंट हैं। हाँ जी। आगे हमारे आगे हमारे लिए कौन से डाइन कीरिया रोकी आपको बता सकते हैं? आप क्या करना चाहती हैं एक एमए किस विषय में कर रही हैं? नहीं मैं मतलब हम आईटीआई भी किए हुए हैं तो अब हम नेक्स्ट टाइम में जाना चाहते हैं क्या किए हुए हैं? इसके विषय में कुछ हेलो आपकी आवाज क्लियर नहीं आ रही है और ये एक्चुअली ओके दिस क्वेश्चन वाज प्रोबेबली नॉट रिलेटिंग टू व्हाट वी डिस्कसिंग मोर रिलेटेड टू करियर काउंसलिंग सो वी आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट सर टू रिज्यूम द डिस्कशन सो विद रिगार्ड टू रिट्स फर्स्ट इज हैवीस कॉर्पस व्हिच इज द मोस्ट इम्पोर्टेंट टूल इन द हैंड्स ऑफ � because it is the duty of the Supreme Court to find that man or woman out. Similarly, there is another writ known as mandamus. Here, Supreme Court can direct the administration to do something which is demanded by any layman. If government is not doing or administration is not doing something, say passport is not being issued to me, in spite of all my efforts, I can just file a writ against the administration. Thirdly, there is prohibition. Prohibition is a writ by which any layman can prohibit any governmental action of public importance. Uh, sir, we are getting another question. Uh, please. Yes, uh, please. जी गुड अफ्टरनून सर गुड अफ्टरनून हम एमआरसी सिंधुगिरि से बोल रहे हैं हाँ जी बोलिए जी हमारा क्वेश्चन है कि इंडिया के जुडिशरी और अमेरिका के जुडिशरी में क्या फर्क है अमेरिका के जुडिशरी और इंडिया के जुडिशरी में क्या फर्क है जी मैम जुडिशरी जो है इंडिया में और जो अमेरिका में जो मैकेजिशन Whereas in Britain, judiciary is not that effective because parliament is sovereign. In the Indian context, there was a vast conflict between executive and judiciary in the year 1970, when power of the judicial review exercised by the Sup Supreme Court in the Golaknath case was questioned by the government, the then government headed by Congress. And ultimately it was resolved 
that judiciary has the power of judicial review. But in the Indian context, most important question with regard to judiciary which has come up is judicial activism. भारत के संदर्भ में जुडिशरी ने कई बार अपने अधिकार क्षेत्र से आगे निकलने की कोशिश की है ऐसा कुछ पॉलिटिकल पार्टीज कहती हैं राइट अमेरिका के संदर्भ में भी यह हुआ 1708 के अंदर जस्टिस मार्शल और द देन प्रेसिडेंट के बीच फिजिकल हाथापाई वहां पर हो गई थी अमेरिका के अंदर मार्बरी वर्सिज मेडिसिन के केस के बाद जुडिशियल रिव्यू स्थापित हो गया पूरी तरीके से ऐसा कोई चीज हिंदुस्तान में नहीं हुई हिंदुस्तान में अभी भी यह कंफ्यूजन है कि क्या जुडिशरी पार्लियामेंट के द्वारा बनाए गए कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनल अमेंडमेंट को या किसी भी कानून को नलीफाई कर सकती है लेकिन डिमांड यह है कि क्योंकि इस जुडिशरी कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन की गार्जियन है वास्ट ऑफ है ये पावर आप जुडिशरी से नहीं छीन सकते और भारतीय पब्लिक के अंदर भी पॉलिटिशियंस के मुकाबले एग्जीक्यूटिव के मुकाबले पार्लियामेंट के मुकाबले जुडिशरी के अंदर उनकी फेज ज्यादा है क्योंकि जुडिशरी एक निष्पक्ष इम्पार्शल प्रोफेशनल बॉडी होती है राइट सर आई वुड लाइक यू टू से टेक ओवर द रिमेनिंग पॉइंट बिकॉज वी हैव लेस अगर रिट्स आर Secretary and Q R N two. With this, we discuss the limits of the judiciary control. First of all, it is very costly. Secondly, judiciary can take notice of the things when there is a case is filed. Judiciary cannot go in open and take a notice of that. Thirdly, judiciary is having self restraint in important matters. It wants to remain aloof. And lastly, judicial activism is there. now last one one or two minutes i'll take control by the people control of the people by the people is by direct action through mass media through rti and through participation people can control the administration but direct action that is strike dharna demonstration etc are the most important tools in the hands of people it is known as people activism and right to information of course is there Over. so uh, uh, thank you so much sir for finishing uh, well in time uh, i am sure that you had to rush through a few things and uh, we would have liked to take more callers but we draw to the close of the lecture so uh, friends today we discussed the executive uh, legislative and judicial uh, methods of control and uh, we'd like to thank sir for being here and for sparing his valuable time and for uh, delivering this very well structured lecture so thank you for watching and for all the questions we really appreciate so have a nice day and keep watching us thank you friends